Hey, Sherry. Hey, Terry. What you doing, Sherry? My boyfriend, Brad, has this totally bitchin' new ride. A new ride? Yeah, it's a Rover 200. What's that? A dog? Duh, it's only the most amazing car in the world. It's got a 1.4 litre K-series engine with four valves per cylinder and multi-point fuel injection. Oh, that's the best. Yeah, I know. Brad said he loves its digital clock, but I think my favourite thing is the fully independent wishbone suspension that gives it amazing handling. My boyfriend Chuck has a Ford Orion. You should dump him. Totally. The Rover 200, more than any other car, encapsulates British Leyland as it went from government ownership through its Honda collaboration to the disastrous BMW marriage and finally its last gasp for survival as an independent company. And it was one of Rover's few big successes, having an amazing 29-year lifespan over its many and varied history. The Rover 200 had many guises, from the Blue Rinse Triumph Acclaim to the hot hatch MGZR, and it's a beloved British car. So why was it such a hit, and why did it all go wrong in the late 90s? This is the Rover 200 story. When it was clear in 1978 that there was no money left in British Leyland's kitty to make a replacement to the Triumph Dolomite, Management came up with an audacious plan. They couldn't afford a new car, so why not team up with another car company? They tried to make a replacement, the SD2, but that dream ended when British Leyland went bankrupt in 1975. So who could they find to collaborate with? The list was initially long and encompassed just about every car company you can think of, but it quickly got whittled down to just two, Chrysler and Honda. Chrysler were the top choice and negotiations got underway to merge the two companies' product lines. But before the deal could be finalised, the American parents sold the European Chrysler operation to PSA, who owned Peugeot and Citroën. PSA weren't interested in working with British Leyland, and in any case, it became clear afterwards just how shaky Chrysler's business was. British Leyland felt they dodged a bullet. Talks were started with Renault, but it became clear very quickly that this wasn't a meeting of equals, and Renault was likely to run roughshod over their smaller partner. So British Leyland put out the feelers to Honda, its second choice. Honda were keen to Europeanise their cars to gain a larger share of the lucrative European market, and felt they could learn valuable lessons from the similar-sized British Leyland. The initial deal was for British Leyland to take one small Honda and build it as a rebadged BL car. There was a little disappointment that it was the saloon version of the Honda Civic, the Honda Ballard. BL had wanted a hatchback, but the working relationship between the two companies went well, and BL CEO Michael Edwards flew out to Tokyo on Boxing Day 1979 to sign the agreement. British Leyland would have their successor to the Dolomite as Project Bounty. As soon as the deal was announced, other European car companies called foul. This was just a way for Japanese car companies to dodge import tariffs. The new car was just a rebadged Honda. It had a point. British Leyland had almost no input into the design, but this was to be the first of many collaborations. But the new car was 80% built in the UK. So just how foreign was it? British Leyland designers initially thought they could make styling changes and made some initial sketches, but the only changes that were made were new seats and a tweaked interior trim. There was concern that this new car, called the Triumph Acclaim, would poach sales from BL's existing Austin Allegro and Morris Ital models. To help prevent this, the Honda Civic-derived car would have an upmarket, higher-spec interior. The mostly elderly public bought the car, and they were happy with the trouble-free motoring they got, a bit of a novelty for British Leyland cars. It showed that when given a well-designed car, the much maligned British Leyland workers could assemble them as well as any in the world. Sales of the Triumph Acclaim will be roughly in line with Beale's predictions, going on to sell 133,000 between 1981 and 1984. With the release of the Acclaim, British Leyland and Honda were already looking for closer ties. 
Both companies began working on a new large car that would become the Honda Legend and Rover 800, and they started discussing the follow-up to the Triumph Acclaim. This time Rover would have a little more input. The SD3 project, as it was called, would be more upmarket than the previous model to further differentiate it from the upcoming Austin Maestro and Montego. The Triumph name was effectively dead after TR7 production ended in 1981, and with the Triumph name being known for inexpensive sports cars, it didn't really fit in an upmarket small saloon. British Leyland had changed their name to Austin Rover, so why not call it a Rover? There was risk of devaluing Rover's name, but Austin Rover had confidence the Honda they would receive would be of high quality. Customer clinics confirmed this was the right move. The Triumph Acclaim had few fleet sales, something Austin Rover badly wanted to rectify. They decided the new model wouldn't only use Honda's 1.3 litre engine, but would be offered with their 1.6 litre S-Series power unit. Suspension would be tweaked, and they focused on improving the interior, showing off their talents in designing high-quality European dashboards and seats. The exterior would be altered to make it more Rover-like, giving it a style similar to the upcoming Rover 800. The current Rovers were the 2000, 2300, 2600 and 3500, so it was natural to call the new car the Rover 1300 and 1600, but they were given a three digit name, aligning it with the new larger Rover 800. This numbering system had been successful for BMW and Rover wanted some of their sheen to rub off on them. They would eventually rename the Austin Metro as the Rover 100 in some markets to make their disparate lineup seem like one cohesive family. The Triumph Acclaim had been too small. It had a low roof and its wheelbase was little different from the Austin Metro. Fortunately, the new car was a little larger, making it more like a mini limo. The new car was launched in 1984 and critics and the public alike loved its British interior styling. Indeed, the Japanese car is known the world over as the very British Hyacinth Bouquet's ride of choice. Although Austin Rover had worked on the Honda suspension, the motor critics decried how lumpy it was. It led Austin Rover to look at it again, finding a major problem. The car would pitch worryingly when accelerating and would corkscrew when cornering. This problem hadn't been picked up by Honda, but Austin Rover engineers quickly fixed the problem and supplied the change to Honda, who put it back in their ballard. Honda and Austin Rover were starting to work more closely together, as could be seen with the successful Rover 800 joint development project that was in full swing. By 1985, the Austin Rover 1.6 litre S series engine had joined the lineup, providing more power using the same Honda gearbox and it would be improved with fuel injection as the car matured. With Austin Rover renamed as simply Rover in 1986, and the Maestro and Montego sales failing, while Rover 200 sales got stronger, it was clear that Rover's future lay with its increasingly strong Honda relationship. This was just fine for Rover's new owners, British Aerospace, who wanted to spend as little money as possible. The Rover 213 and 216 did well, selling 418,000 cars between 1985 and 1990. Honda sold the Civic in the UK, but held off selling a saloon version there to prevent cannibalizing Rover sales. But the next small Ronda, as the Rover-Honda joint developments were being called, would be both a hatchback and a saloon, now that the decision had been made not to replace the Maestro hatchback and Rover wanted a much bigger part in developing the new car. The first two cars had very little Rover input, but with Honda and Rover working hand in hand to produce the new Rover 800, both companies started work on the new Rover 200 late in 1984. The Rover 800 had relatively few shared parts with its Honda counterpart, and both companies didn't want this duplication of effort with the new Rover 200. So the decision was made to divide and conquer. Rover did the interior design and suspension tuning. Both teams would work on their own exterior styling packages, with the Rover team doing their half in Japan. Rover's style would be conservative, but was well proportioned and elegant, 
and it's clear future Ford Escorts would take design cues from Rover's new car. The engine would be the new K-series engine that Austin Rover had fought so hard to get funding for when they were owned by the British government. It was designed to offer high fuel economy and power for small cars with combinations from 1.1 litres up to 1.6 litres. It was hoped this engine with the new Rover 200 would help revive Rover's flagging fortunes. The new Rover 200 would use a 1.4 variant of the K-series and the Honda 1.6 litre. And Rover considered Cabriolet and MG variants to produce a full range. Where Honda and Rover disagreed on the Rover 800 suspension, with Honda finally winning out, Honda allowed Rover to choose a suspension package for the European version of the Rover 200. Given Rover's ability in this area, it was a smart move, and Rover knew more about how to design a European feel. But Honda were taking notes. They'd been learning car design from British car manufacturers since the 1960s, and this information along with the new UK base in Swindon, helped shape future European Hondas. When it launched, Rover did something they'd seldom done before. They priced the car at a premium over the competition. It was a big gamble that could backfire, but the gamble paid off. Customers saw the car's quality, and it sold more than the model it replaced. With company cars being such big sellers at this time, Drivers chose the Rover as it was seen to be a higher class car. Honda released the car as a Honda Concerto and sold it in all markets including the UK. For the first time the twin Honda and Rovers would go head to head. And thanks to Rover's depth in the market and its quality, it won through. In fact only 126,000 Concertos were sold in Europe between 1989 and 1995 and the Hondas were built by Rover at Longbridge. Rover would go on to sell almost 1 million Rover 200s over the same period. Like the Rover SD1, the car won a raft of awards, but unlike the SD1, this car had bulletproof reliability and no supply problems. Rover had been learning from its Japanese counterparts, and their factories had undergone a transformation. Gone was the them and us mentality, management and workers ate together and solved problems together. As the 80s gave way to the 90s, Rover's future was looking bright. The Rover 200 was a hatchback, so the saloon model was released as the Rover 400. And Rover wouldn't stop there, they produced open top, coupe and estate versions to capitalise on this runaway success. The car got a small makeover in 1994 putting a grille on the front to fit the family image championed by the Rover 600. So, flush with success, in 1991 Rover decided to build a new upmarket Super Mini to replace their aging Rover Metro, called the Rover 100. This new car would use a cut down Honda Civic chassis, making it bigger than the competition. It would be Rover's first all new car since the Austin Montego and it would be designed on a shoestring budget, just £200 million. Their target was the younger driver, although it was questionable that Rover could somehow marry a youthful image with Rover's traditional leather and walnut look. Rover went to Japan to discuss the next version of the Rover 200, which they knew would be designed around the next generation Honda Civic, but they were surprised to find that this time it wouldn't be a collaboration. Honda had already done most of the design work and they would complete it on their own. Rover could use it for their next car or take the long flight back to Birmingham. The Rover team went back to parent British Aerospace for guidance and were told, work with Honda, there's no other option. With all Rover's bravado about being able to design amazing cars, they were still fully reliant on the whim of their Japanese partner. It's clear that Honda were cooling to the Rover relationship. Their UK Swindon plant was now online, and it, not Rover's Longbridge factory, would be producing their new car. With the Honda Concerto selling far less than the Rover counterpart, it seems Honda wanted to control their own European destiny, and had learnt all they could from Rover about how to make European cars. Despite having a 20% stake in Rover, Honda didn't purchase the company outright, leaving BMW to snap it up in 1994. 
the Honda Rover love affair was over. So the new Rover 400 would be the rebadged Honda Civic and would be both a hatchback and a saloon, replacing both the 200 and 400 models. The saloon would be designed by Rover and a small Rover styling job would be done to prepare it for launch. This time Rover engines would be used throughout and it was set up with soft suspension to produce a forgiving, luxurious ride. It was all change again when in 1994 Rover was sold to BMW. This put Honda in a tricky position, but they allowed the Civic design to be used for future Rovers, securing the Rover 400's impending release. The new Rover 100 Super Mini and Rover 400 were launched in 1995, but the marketing men made a very strange decision. The Super Mini would be renamed the Rover 200, even though it was much smaller than the outgoing 200 model. While every other car company made their new models slightly larger, Rover would buck the trend. They figured people would pay more for their premium product, so they could sell a smaller car for the same price as the larger competition. To add to the confusion, the Ford Escort sized Rover 400 would compete with cars in the larger Ford Mondeos class. Rover was again betting that customers would pay more for their higher prestige cars, despite their higher price and smaller size. But these cars didn't look like they were higher prestige. The competition had caught up and the new Rovers didn't look any better. Rover was forced to discount each car to help sell them, eating into the meager profit they got after Honda royalty payments. Critics gave the new cars good, if not impressive reviews, but they didn't like the Rover 400's soft, wallowing suspension. Sales did relatively well, considering the Metro, Maestro and Montego had ceased production, so these customers lightly migrated to the new 200 and 400 cars. Both cars would sell a respectable 940,000 cars, between 1995 and 1999. In keeping with the Rover 200's youth image, Rover made hot VI and BRM LE versions, producing a respectable 0-60 time of 7.9 seconds. They stopped short of badging it as an MG, because Rover and BMW wanted to reserve that for pure sports cars like the MGF. With BMW as the new owner, it was all change at Rover. The new larger Rover would be the 75, and the small car, when it launched in 2000, would be the new Mini. BMW decided to fund a replacement medium-sized car, but the release would have to wait until 2002. In the meantime, Rover did light reworkings to turn the 200 and 400 into the 25 and 45 models in 1999. They got a styling update to put them more in line with the upcoming Rover 75, and they were more realistically pitted against cars in their class. The following year, BMW decided enough was enough and sold the failing Rover to the Phoenix Consortium, a hastily created company that would try to make Rover a going concern. But without the Mini that BMW kept, they were left with the Rover 75 and the old dated 25 and 45. All designs for the 25 and 45 successor were taken back to BMW's headquarters, and if rumours are true, they were offered to MG Rover for £300 million, then to various Chinese manufacturers before being used to create the BMW 1 series in 2004. So the Rover 200 may yet live on as the midget BMW, but MG Rover couldn't afford to buy or build a new car. With few options, they decided to lean on MG's sporting roots and produce low-slung, fire-breathing, hot versions of the 25 and 45, called the MG ZR and ZS in 2001. But the car-buying public could see them for what they were, 10-year-old cars with trim kits and tuned engines. In 2003, the 25 got an urban warrior makeover with the Streetwise. The suspension was raised, grey moulded bumpers added and a roof rack was slapped on top. With no changes to the rest of the car, it wasn't going to be off-roading anytime soon, but it looked good on the school run. With one last roll of the dice, MG Rover did another restyle of the 25 and 45 in 2004, but it was all too little too late. The company folded in 2005, 
to be sold to the Nanjing Automobile Group for £53 million. Sales of the 25 and 45 ended up being just over half a million cars. But that wasn't the end for the Plucky 200. Nanjing restarted production of the Streetwise in China in 2008 with Rover's stalwart K-Series engine, but production ended just two years later after selling only 22,000 cars. To keep my videos free from adverts, to get early access to new videos, or appear in the credits, please consider supporting me using the Patreon link below from just $1 or 80p a month, and hit the subscribe button to get notified of new videos. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next video.